Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's Regen uh, live chat. Tonight, we're going to be mainly talking about sheep and with the questions, can sheep be regenerative? Tonight, um, my, myself, which is Liz Jennifer, is joined by Nick. Um, we'll introduce ourselves in a moment. And we're also joined by Jan Ledoux and Rich Thomas, whose details are on the slide at the moment, but also we'll have a chat with them in a second in terms of just introducing their background. So, Nick, how are things with you? Um things are okay. I've um, had a couple of weeks off work. I've been to the seaside, um, spent two hours today on the phone, getting in the phone. Um, and no, things were all right. Um, we did our first um, farm walk yesterday, farm tour. Um, so Renault Mullet entertained um, some customers. And yeah, no, all's good. But looking forward to tonight's chat because uh, we haven't done much on sheep. And um, yeah, it'd be interesting, definitely. Yeah. Well, my news is I've got a mouse in my house, so I'm dealing with that shortly. Oh. So that's my news. That's it, really. But yeah, and I did, uh, <laughs> last Friday, did my first discussion group since Friday, uh, Wednesday. No, not Wednesday, since February. So it's uh, it's starting, not quite returning to normal, but starting to. So that's good. And did the farmers enjoy, enjoy getting out? Apart from the rain and the wind and the acoustics of an outside situation, it was fine. But no, I think they yeah appreciated being out, definitely. Okay, so on that random chat update, uh, again, we um, just like to say thank you very much to Fiona Lovett of Flock Health Limited for allowing us to use her Zoom. And also this evening, we've got Joseph Keating, who's been the question master. So as we go through... Um, as we go through everybody else is on mute so if you want to ask a question if you type it into the chat function that's at the bottom of the screen um, ideally into the chat rather than Q&A um, and then Joseph will be looking at them as we go through and, and then we'll be asking questions at appropriate time so if you've got any questions in terms you can't hear or you've got a point of clarification just put it in the chat button at the bottom and we'll deal with it as we best we can um, so Nick, do you want to get us started with some background from the, our guests for this evening? Yeah, so, so throughout all our chats, we've spent a lot of time talking about cows, really, and cattle and, and tall grass grazing and mob grazing. And we haven't really ventured anywhere near sheep. And as far like Liz is a sheep expert, and uh, we've got sheep here. Inverted commas. <laughs> And, and so we, we are going to tackle dairy as well, because I think um, both sheep and dairy and regenerative is an interesting dilemma, really, on, on how, you, how you do it. Because I think cattle, beef cattle, are quite easy to put in a box and think, well, I can do it this way. Um, so we have got Jan Ledoux, great name, and Rich Thomas, also a great name. Um, so... Um, Liz, I'll let you introduce Jan, but um, Rich farms in Wales. Um, he was a no. no, what? Sorry, no, Wales. I thought you were Wales. Sorry. Herefordshire. Herefordshire, with, the, with this yeah. side of the world. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. See, this, is live. this is live. This is live. Your farms in Herefordshire. Rich, would you like to introduce yourself so I don't make any more cuts? <laughs> What, how quick do you want? Quick pricey? Uh, yeah, not too long. Not too long. So Brief. Two, 250 acres at home and 100 rented grass keep. Pretty, yeah, pretty much all grass keep around and about. Um, Herefer cattle, Romney Cross Aberfield use, moving to probably going, well, we're going to go south of placing and whether that's all Romney or whatever, I don't know, we'll work that out. A um, little bit of arable and cider fruit. So, yeah, there you go. Okay, thanks. Um, Jan, Ledoux? Uh, <laughs> <Could> <laughs> yeah, just just to add to the little bit that came out with the invite. Um, yeah, ten, 10 years in agriculture research after university, um, which was, seems a hell of a long time ago now, which I guess it is. And one, mostly working with uh, beef and dairy cattle, uh, defining grazing height, requirements for the optimum management of both suckler cows and uh, dairy cows um, and then decided well that's not too difficult so I'll make my life a lot more difficult and go and see if I can farm. Um, my mother's family had always farmed but 
none of it was left when it came to me. They'd all managed to go broke along the ro road and it had all disappeared. Um, so in 1981, I set off on my own. At that stage, the uh, sheep situation was that such that you knew, the, the subsidies were such that you knew exactly what you were going to get for your, your lamb on every week of, every, of the year. So it was a lot easier to go to the bank with a um, cash flow situation that made a bit of sense to them. And I borrowed what now didn't seem very much, but then seemed a hell of a lot of money. And within a very short period of time, the interest rates were about 15%. So you young guys have got it bloody easy now. That's all I can say in terms of interest rates. Um, I then, on various tenancies over the next 30 odd years, built up and I finished up with sort of 2,000 ewes and 100 suckler cows at one stage <coughs> before seeing the light and getting rid of a lot of the cows um, and cutting back down and running sort of eight to 900 ewes and 1,200 ewe lambs, um, mostly on my own in a May lambing set up uh, towards the end of my farming career, which I retired from in 2013. Um, sold all my my whole flock effectively into a, somebody who was going into sheep in a re, this is where this bit today comes in in a regen ag herbal lay set up um, worked with them for a while and now do a reasonable amount of mentoring in various places to various people um, and so that's that's about me really I guess thank you I'm just I'm intrigued by and how much of that applied research that you got from that 10 years or so as a researcher did you then use or did you add to it as well uh I've, I've always certainly going of more recent times when I've had had involvement with other people's suckler cows particularly um been able to use a lot of that in terms of being able to assess the amount of grass there is on a paddock um and when the cows need to be taken out and so on. Uh, I must admit, I've never in my own farming life used a swall stick or a pasture meter because I, I could, having spent 10 years me measuring virtually everything, uh, you get a pretty good idea of what is what in a, on a pasture. <laughs> um, but yeah, I used a lot of that in terms of pasture budgeting and so on. I've done that, all, albeit, more in my head than any, or on the back of a envelope, rather than doing it on a in a program sort of way, um, and use that throughout, both with the sheep and cattle. With the sheep, particularly um, when uh, overwintering sheep on other people's grass pastures, it was very useful from that point of view. <clears throat> You know, I could have have a pretty good idea of how much grass there was on a say a twenty acre field, so I'd put X number of ewes in it, and I'd have a pretty good idea when I need to go back and shift them again. So okay. yeah, the, the 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 basic information from that ten years has has stood me in pretty good stead, really. Thank you, and and Rich, from your perspective, so you've just sort of started in your journey towards. Well, that sounds patronising, but you, you mean you're you're very much in that early stages of that regenerative approach. So, where are you getting your information from? Um, like our, what the WhatsApp group. I started with Gabe Brown, and then the, the 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 David R Montgomery book, and that was the one that really changed my mind. That's the one I'd say. It's not. It's actually a bad read, and I listened to it, and I've read for. I've got it as well, as well. But um, um, and then yeah, YouTube videos, and then just like articles, and just it, it, all those things are all kind of pointed in the idea. You know, those the five rules or the six rules of 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 looking after the soil. They're all pointing at those things basically. So it's just hearing the same thing in a lot of different ways from a lot of different people who who are. Trying all trying to do the same thing. So um, somebody's asked what book? The Gabe Brown, Dirt to Soil, and then David R. Montgomery, Growing a Revolution. And then if you want some history, Dirt, about how basically every civilization, well, not quite every, but many civilizations on the planet 
basically destroyed themselves because they ran out of food because they cultivated the soil and it washed down the rivers. It's a very simple thing, but yeah, yeah. So it's it's out there if you want to find it. But the the the, the, the WhatsApp group and the the local knowledge because it's not very focused on the UK because we're such an easy climate. Uh, supposedly an easy climate to farm in we haven't had to worry about soil blow and you know lack of rain generally because it's generally quite easy to farm here uh, that's a very a generalization but compared to many places in the in the world it it is it is basically yeah so, so rich before you, you 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 left college and then you did you farm your sheep just in a quite conventional way until till what point I went to a couple of meetings with Charlie Morgan. Um, some of you might might know um, from the, the Welsh Borders. Um, just talking about how you know we split a field and you see how much more grass you grow when you move move the stock a bit more often. Did that. Bought some electric fence and did that. And because um, I could see you know down the road we, you know the BPS is going to go and it was it was you know there will be a tax on nitrogen at some point. There will be a, the diesel's not going to carry on being as cheap as it is. I don't care what anybody says like. Maybe I'm talking 10 years hence, but we, we will have to change at some point. So we started doing that. And then suddenly you say, oh, right, OK, the dairy industry has been doing this for years. Why are we not doing it? And probably because it's a hassle. You know, that's a lot easier to set stock in, isn't it? But if you're dairying and you're getting your stock in twice a day to, to milk the cows, well, you move in fences. It's just the whole thing kind of is more it's easier, isn't it? So um, and then I planted some red clover because I read an article about that. And that was really good. And then. It's just, you know, more fences. And we because we've taken a lot of the arable and put it into grass, we've got a lot of temporary grass, but we've still got quite a lot of permanent pasture as well. So it's it's just and we're definitely growing more grass. We're going in the right direction. I haven't cracked it yet by any stretch, but that was the sort of And so in terms of how long do you think that although I was rude and said you just started, that process has been what, ten years? No, like five. Okay. And this year is the first year we've had cattle properly on a rotation. Um, well, some only are properly on a uh, you know rotational grazing system. Sheep have been for like three now, I think. Yeah, and two possibly, but three. Yeah. And that has moved from a conventional rotational system, like going in at what 10, 12 centimeters down to four or five, or kilos of dry matter. And but you're now moving to these sort of taller covers. Yeah, where I can. Yeah, I think. Um, well, the, the the three leaf rule was where I started, but now I'm trying to go like 30, 40 days, 50, 60 days if you can. But it's um, I haven't got because the permanent pasture doesn't grow much grass. The the temporary grass is having to be grazed probably more often than it should be, so it's um. Yeah, it's a gradual process where we try and get everything to. I mean, it might take it might take ten years to get the permanent pasture to be growing what it should be, but that's the that's the direction of travel. Yeah, is, has all the temporary grass got? Is all that multi species, or is the some of it still just a, a rye grass? It'd be half and half. So do you do you manage the two differently? The the all grass versus the multi species. Um, I, I'm not particularly, I guess. I'm just trying to get as much rest. I'm trying not to go back until I think it's had enough rest. Because, I think, sorry. No, no, I think we've just, we've jumped ahead and that was my fault when I asked the question. But I didn't know, because we I think we suppose we'd, we've jumped ahead in terms of, we've already started to solve the problem in terms of can sheep be regenerative? So I'm just interested from, there's some questions for Jan on the thing um, on the chat in terms of you sold your flock to Tim May. Yeah. And so, and you said he'd just started regenerative. So what was your experience of that? You had moved from a, a mixed sward or mixed species sward sort of approach. So a lot of white clover, red clover, similar to what um, Richard just been talking about. And you were then moving into this t sort of tall grass grazing. So can you just explain it, your experience it, of that? It wasn't quite as simple as that in that I must admit, I, I went to the regenerative thing as an aged, devout skeptic, I guess, like I said earlier on. Um, as a, trained as a scientist, you tend to be skeptical first, I'm afraid. Um, but 
in in the first instance when the because all the all the pastures on that farm had all been sown either in the autumn of the previous year or under sown in the year we first started there with the sheep so they were all new um and in initially in any case we were with the sheep only trying to graze in my terms if you like going in at uh, I don't know 15 20 centimeters and going down to five um, that was with the sheep we had, we had cattle on there as well which were doing the the sort of two foot six high sort of stuff right from the start um, but with the with the sheep the first year we lambed there uh, long grass was it we were lambing in May long grass to me was a bit of a problem in terms of um, ewes with permanently wet udders, lambs with permanently wet navels and a, a lot of problems with joint ill and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I wasn't overly enthusiastic about the uh, long grass grazing and regenerative from that point of view and I couldn't see, I must admit, I couldn't see the logic of needing to do that with ewes and lambs. I, was, I thought we were doing a, a pretty good job and I mean, you can show some of the photos if you like Liz um pretty good job with the pastures grazing them from say foot or so down to um oh, what are we? not quite as much as that so 10 12 14 centimeters um down to four or five the, the pictures here um i don't know how well that comes across really the first one from the left is usual out you lambing probably about the 5th or 6th of May on a pasture that had been sown. I think that would probably been sown the pre, where are we, May? The previous um, May, June time. Um, that's in, in May. And the next one across is the similar pasture about a month later. The, they were set stocked at, at lambing time. The next one, say, the, the white clover beginning to show itself. And so, just to clarify, um, this was your this was your original system. This is the one that you developed. And no, ran. well, we, we were grazing the um, uh, herbal lays, if you like, at Tim's on that sort of system to start with. We were, we were uh, set stocking at lambing and going to bulk up the numbers subsequently because I wasn't happy that you could lamb on towards a foot or 18 inches high. So we, we had grazed them fairly tight down through the early part of the spring. So that at lambing time, we had a, a, a set stock type sward to lamb on, you know, something that was uh, four, five, eight centimeters tall, something of that sort. Yeah. The, the, Let's look, go through Is that better? Photos. Sorry, I, I did something wrong on the thing. That should yeah. show them better. Don't, don't matter. You can go to that next one now, Liz, if you like. Yeah, the, the presentations are coming across better now, Liz. Um, just while you go through the breeds, um, one question just came through is, um, do you mention the, just the breeds that are on the farms? No, those are all mule ewes uh, with... Uh, Texan Beltex, mainly Texan Beltex rams. Um, the picture on the left hand side, again, this is uh, sort of mid June, I think, from memory, it's a long time ago now. There's where you can see the burnt strip, that's a electric fence line because they were, remember, this was coming out of uh, an arable farm with enormous fields. Um, you know, they, they thought nothing of having a hundred plus acre fields. Uh, Tim's father had bulldozed the hedges out in the days when you got um, subsidies for bulldozing hedges out. So we, we got them split up so eventually we could rotationally graze them. The picture on the left, uh, I'm trying to wreck it. Yeah, in fact, this one, it, it to some extent, so there's a bit of another interest in this one in that there's two different uh, seed houses, is swords here, one on left, one on right. 
and I won't say which one's which, but they did prefer one to the other. <laughs> these two, the interesting thing about these two is that they contrast in terms of when they're taken. The first one is in sort of early June, and then a bit later on in, into July, you see a difference in the uh, species that are coming through and showing the dominance in that the July one, the red clover and the um, trefoils are, are showing a lot more. Um, and we, by the time we got to July, we were blocking stuff up and were grazing longer, which these ones would have been 15 or 18 inches tall when they were grazed. But by that time, the lambs were a good size and could cope, and we could see them when we were going in to, to check them. And in terms of what heights, so you were grazing them to what height at that point? So they were coming out at what? They, we'd, we'd try and... To be quite honest, at that stage we got we were severely understocked. To be quite honest, um, you can see from from a, one of the pictures later on we were coming out at probably oh seven or eight centimeters, not not grazing it anywhere near as tight as you would have done. Uh, if, well, if you were starting off lower with a, with an all grass wall. Yeah, this this one here. That's that's again. It's a bit later on in the season. That's probably in August, I think. Um, that's a, again a fence line just having moved out of the piece on the left um, into the bit on the right there's, there's a lot of red clover in that one on the right um, and a reasonable amount of actual trampling having occurred you know it, it isn't defoliated tight tight but they've stomped it down so in, in some ways height exit height isn't uh, overly helpful in that context I guess um, but you can see the, the sort of swords we were going into and coming out of and it, it was all uh, high value feed we weren't letting it there was there was one vast quantities of grass seeds or um, chicory stalks we managed to keep on top of those reasonably well and so in so, terms of and as Rich was saying before I diverted him in terms of the rest days so yeah. with with this sort of these mixed swords what would you what would you be giving them as rest periods the the these would have again we were so understocked at that stage um but the, in terms of the sort of budgeting for it we were talking about 35 something of that sort of thing from memory it's a long time ago now okay and so the so the main so the main point of that is so that so that sword height can shift over the over that season but in terms of management makes it for sheep it's got to be relatively controlled in the spring just for management ease particularly yeah if I, I, I think season. so from from purely and simply from the point of view of um health and well, well-being of the lambs i mean that will see what you're doing um it, it does concern me i know rich said you don't he, he's never seen sheep disappear into uh, pastures that <laughs> you'd lose them but if we'd have been putting the sheep into the pastures that the cattle were going into on the other side of the farm we wouldn't have been able to see the sheep because they were going in at, at, at this stage in in sort of june july time they would they would have been going into stuff that was, was for, you'd see the ewes heads but not much else i don't think and it would have been the job to see the see the lambs certainly the small lambs and i i, I must admit i wasn't happy to be trying to manage lambs in that context Oops. And so I've just I've just skipped forward because this is some these are some pictures Rich has sent me recently and so Gene is quite similar in terms of yeah that approach yeah and in terms of the sort of height and Rich would you are you wanting to push that height higher do you think or it's just as you said it's to do with just having enough land in in good fettle perhaps um, it's a bit of both I'd like to say the it would have been nice to have left this longer, I think. Um, but that's 30 days after mowing. And um, there's 400 lambs on there, on a hectare. And two days is just about, actually I moved them a day and a half. So the next move is tomorrow morning. That was a day, I'll be a day and a half because they're just chomping through it. Um, but hopefully I'll have a draw end of the week and then I'll slacken it a bit. Um, so Rich, are you are you set stock at lambing? How do you well, lamb? Well, 
last year we drift lambed. You know, you have a bunch of say 50 and then 10 lamb and you move you move the rest on, you move them on, you move them on. This year I set stocked, but I I just couldn't I couldn't I I'm not the best shepherd, I'll be honest. I just couldn't work always work out what had lambed and what hadn't. And it just got really confusing, the ones that might have lost the lamb or something. So I'm going back to drift lambing next year. I've got a couple of really good dogs, well, pretty good dogs, quiet. We could, we the year before was a lot better. Uh, and now I've got my fences and everything a bit better and it's all the infrastructures there. I've got more water pipes, I've got more tanks. Like I'm just gonna drift lamb and then I'll know what obviously what's in what place hasn't lambed or has lost one and what's what and what's got lambs where it was is fine. And that's just that just that's just me anyway. I, I, I can uh, see and that. then you'll and then you'll group them up into what size bobs will they be grouped up? Group them up four weeks and then um um or thereabouts, you know, first gather, first, first, first injection, first ovivac, first drench, whatever, and then a um, um, hundred. I think we had 150 twins last year. I don't think it was quite that many this time, but last year it was. And maybe you know, maybe do it slowly. You might start off with you know, put two small, two bunches of 50 together, and then you might bring another bunch of 50 in or something. I don't think you want to do it on the same day. And you might just want to leave a gate open and let them drift in or put them in a bigger field to start. But do you know what I mean? You can, you can, I think if you do it slowly, I, th I think they're fine. So Jan mentioned how he found lambing in the tool tub was quite tricky. Have, have you, have you come across, have you had more problems of mastitis going to that kind of thing? To be honest, I haven't, I haven't built up enough of a wedge over the winter to be able to do that. So I'm normally lambing at like 2000 ish, two and a half max lambing covers, maybe less, you know? So, um, that's just, that's just, I, I'd like to have more, but then what Jan says makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I, I would, so obviously I'm going to, I'm thinking now, right, I need to be nervous about that, but the way things are at the moment, probably lamb on the permanent pasture more so. And then they go into once they're a few days old, they can move into the or a bit older, where week old, they can go into the herbal lays then. And they, it's, I think that that I can't remember the um, the word for it, but if 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 the mother has whatever she eats during pregnancy, it um, it helps the lamb to uh, to know that that it will eat that. And I think when they're little and they're introduced to it by their mother as well, it's better rather than just like say the whole of their life they're on like knackered permanent pasture and then they wean them onto red clover or something sort of learn 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 behavior really that, that that you'd see yeah i can understand the, the logic behind that whether, whether whether it's actually true or not i'm not sure but it it, it makes perfect sense i think and, it's probably the speed that, of development i think they'll get to it don't they they'll yeah they'll just take a bit longer perhaps but it's certainly for that transition, it's probably an easier transition for them. Yeah. And, it, and it makes a lot of sense what you're saying about lambing on the permanent pasture where you can see what you're doing um, and, and then drawing them off onto the, onto the, if you've got two, 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 three on your um, herbal lays at that stage, you know, there's, there's tons there to, for you with twins or, or even triplets to milk very well on really. That sounds in, in a lot of ways ideal. You're, you're optimising the use of your resources, which is what, you're, <laughs> what the whole objective is, really. So picking up, I suppose, the point, which is this, particularly of the various books out there and maybe not developed from the UK system, is this sort of tall grass, do you mean long root systems, building up the humus and all of that, those factors. And Jan asked, I suppose, that question, which is, Rich, do you know like how poor are your soils? Do you know how much change could happen through these techniques? I've upset him. He's off. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no. um, but because so that <laughs> some of the challenge isn't it, with some of this is making sure that we get a bit of a bench, like a baseline, before we start changing everything to actually work out to make sure that we are doing the right thing. I'm not sure yeah, who have asked so, that question, but Rich was the question yeah, to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, we did some organic matter tests and I know there's different theories about which the best or soil organic matter test is to do. And I'm sure somebody will put up on the chat what the basic one is, um, what it's called. Uh, anyway, we did that and the, the best field that I thought would be 
like maybe high single figures was five percent and everything else was like one or two and then really? that's not the feel and end all I thought you know crikey you know that's not really good there you are ben's got it lost on ignition so so that and i know that's not necessarily doesn't tell you everything but it's a good place to start maybe but all the p's and k's are right all the ph's are right so on a standard soil test yeah that's fine but it's not the soil i don't think so our soils are working properly and there's not enough roots in the ground so it's that kind of thing if you if you assume that you know we all know drenches are losing efficacy and oh we've got resistance to this so we've got to use zolvix and startec which cost like a million pounds and we want to keep them actually for when we've got a problem so uh, and the trace elements is massive but that's another thing again but i think it, it all kind of points towards grazing higher covers now it doesn't mean it has to be three foot tall you can't see the sheep like jan said if you're in those covers that he showed you know maybe whatever you know a foot tall or three thousand or two thousand and building up through the year that's good I, I don't see any reason why that why that shouldn't be a problem as long as you don't make the sheep eat the stalk and eat it down to you know ankle height while they're when they're eating rubbish just let them have the best and um you know i don't see a problem with that with with your different soil organic matters that that you measured had you any indication of, as to whether those the history of the fields that that was associated with um could you sort of pinpoint why they were like that because you said you had got some arable so a, 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 some of it been arable to death as it were so historically the farm was in the farm was in um hops we had like 30 acres of hops and then we only had it we had a brook running through the farm which was the water and we had the farms kind of like and it's almost two little mini valleys sort of so the fields that were accessed from the brook were in grass, mostly permanent pasture, and everything that wasn't was in arable because there was no water system. So when we put the water system in and we pulled the hops out, suddenly we, we've got this land that we need to, you know, want to do something with, and we arable and grass and something, and now it's basically mostly grass. And so, um, yeah, there's a little bit of too much ploughing, but mostly just set stocking and, and overgrazing, I think. Uh, Joseph, have we got any questions? Yes, you you beat me to it. Um, so we have a few questions. I'm trying to sort through questions, book recommendations, and something about olives. Olive. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sunny, uh, my parents mustn't like olives because I can't stand them. Um, so that's that. Because you're not that's fancy cool. enough. You have to force yourself to like them to be fancy. No, that's what I did. I'll I'll stick to the um, stereotype. I'll stick to the spuds. Um, <laughs> I'll stick with the olives. Yeah, uh, I suppose just one or two questions for you, Jan. Just going back, to kind of the pictures you're shown. Um, what were mob sizes uh, for the twins lambing in? Uh, majority of them would be in 150, some slightly bigger. We got two or three lots of uh, ewe lambs as well, um, and they would have been sort of 200, 250, something like that. Um, and I think Richie, you answered. And, and running at about running at about five, five used the acre, something of that sort. If you get them much closer than that, when you're lambing outside, the damn things will all try and lamb together. It doesn't matter how big the field is. Um, and then just another one is, uh, how long were they in each cell? So how many days, like, were you working on before they moved? Is that to me or to Rich? Yeah, sorry to you, Jan. I think uh, they were set Rich has um, at that stage. The, the, the one the, at lambing, they were set stop at that stage I think they went on uh, later on after I'd uh, departed they went on to drift land them at some stage um, but that that it wasn't something I could ever get on with very well maybe dog wasn't good enough but uh, well just on the set do you know what age they started to group them up um, the lambs to, to start the rotating uh, for you Jan yeah, oh, they'd, they'd, they'd have been a month, month old, I expect, by then. I mean, um, we got, they were pretty big groups in the first place. You see, there were 150, 200 in a group. Um, I mean, again, I think it, after I'd left, uh, wasn't involved anymore. They had some pretty enormous groups. And I don't know, did I send you a picture of that, Liz? There's one picture there with, no, I probably didn't send that one. About eight or 900 used in their lambs. It was hell of a job to get them to handle them you need some sort of handling set up when you're going to do something with that size group um then just 
one or two others. I think, well, I'll, I'll start with you, Rich. Um, have you found, how, how have you found worms on the taller covers? Uh, sorry, it's just replying to someone asked Just me typing. Um, <laughs> yeah, less, less for sure, for sure. Last year we probably wormed too much. This year we, we have just used, um, I just used a, 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 a moxidectin, which I haven't used for, I don't know if you ever used one actually. I've used ivermectin, but not a moxidectin. I think that's right. Yeah, maybe once, but that would be a long time ago. I can hardly remember. Um, but I think, and I might be jumping the heck on a bit, but I think it all comes back to trace elements. It, one is not exposure. So if they're grazing higher covers, then, and, and part of our grazing group, we remember being told that if that leaf is like six inches tall, or it's, or the leaf is on a plant that is 10 inches tall or 12 inches tall, it doesn't really make a difference. If the animal is eating the leaf, it will preferentially graze better nutritional value than you can than you could if you cut it all and fed it back to it they, they will graze better than you can actually give them if you, if you see what i mean so so there's no point in taking it down you, you know you're taking your cover you've got less less photosynthesis uh, all those things you already know so you might as well just let them eat the leaf up here where there's less worms and yeah no problem well yeah no problem so just kind of following on from that in terms of the covers then do you top uh behind the sheep or do you use different stock to clear up after them or is that what's what's left is left for the next regrowth if that makes sense a bit of both try not to top but dad's topping a bit um um but um in where only if there's like another problem like so a weed issue then we've got a couple of places where there's a few too many docks and a couple of places where we've got creeping thistle but um other than that, no, just 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 leave it. Just let it just leave it. Because that's your solar panel, isn't it? That's that's your that's gold, that is. You cut it off and start again. You just this what's the point? Um, and, then, and would you sorry, Joseph, would they would you use cattle at all? Would you push cattle through behind them? Well I, me, I, I would, but I had Alex Brewster um came from Scotland, he's, he's got a very good nut field. If anybody wants to look it up, it's brilliant actually, really good nut field. He, he was saying about, it, if you could bring the cattle in like a day after, maybe, but that would only be like dry cows. And then you've got issues with fences and stuff and I'm not up for that. But if you take the sheep food first and let them browse the best, and then you've got your, you've got your rest period, recovery period of whatever it is, you know, 21 days in the spring maybe, and maybe 45 in the autumn, and then bring the cows to and get them to eat it down, and then it will grow back again, and the sheep get the best again. That's what Alex was saying, and then you get that sort of pulse in, you get them building the roots in the soil, but you wouldn't want to bring the cows to anything after three days, and it is literally three days, because um, you're just eating the regrow then, and you're just defeating the object, I think. And then just... Sorry, Joseph. Um, well, it's just two quick last questions and then I'll, I'll hand it back. So one was, um, did you have any issues with feet getting sore in the longer covers? We are getting a little bit of um, um, scald. Um, so, yeah, that is a, an issue. Uh, whether I'll be able to breed that out in a couple of years' time, I don't know. But, yeah, that is, that is a minor problem. Um, and this last question is probably more open to all. Um, how does this translate to more upland hill situations in terms of what you're doing? <laughs> That's almost Silence. one for you to answer, Nick, I think. Uh, <laughs> They're going in your direction. <laughs> well, no, it's not for me to answer this, time, but I personally think that um, we just need to move away from step stocking. Um, just because of the roots and recovery and um, but it's not, it's, oh, it's not as easy when you've got a big hill, is it? Um, no. um, but there, there, there are ways around it, I think, but that's where we need to be heading towards. Um, Liz, have you got any wisdom? Yeah, I think it's, it's similar, which is the, June, we all, well, I tend to be based down in the sort of in the flatlands where, do you mean it's quite nice and we can put some herbalase mm -hmm. into some mixed, do you mean arable systems? But yes, yeah, so the, the options are less however potentially the organic matter that you're starting with is going to be higher in those situations so you don't you don't have to work quite so hard to build it up like you do in other places um, but
but I agree it's a lot of it's driven by infrastructure or well, the infrastructure was there and there's been some lack of investment <clears> perhaps in some of it um, but it's, it's still I, for me it's about the objective of what that farm and farmer wants to do or needs to do um, and I suppose there's options in terms of trees and other things going into those sort of areas as well that could that could play a part as well that probably isn't as applicable down in the middle of Lincolnshire because again where, where you where you've got a reasonable soil organic matter anyhow you're not necessarily wanting to, to increase it you know it's probably high enough as it is but in terms of using rotational grazing to grow more grass that that's still a, uh, an objective as Nick pointed out really and you and you could argue in a quite a lot of those areas which is it's actually a pH thing that's limiting production yeah. Yeah. So it's investment in lime that is needed to drive that grass on, get more from grass and also system choice. So during the desire to finish lambs or finish cattle in some of those situations is very costly compared to moving them, like selling a stores and moving off farm. So it's just also thinking about how the system fits together as well. Um, right. So we're moving on really to the next section or the next chunk. of. Um, so we've sort of the debate and we've heard from Jan in terms of stocking rate. So one of your, it's a good and a bad thing, isn't it, from a sheep perspective, but you low stocking rate when you, your, that, um, when you first went to Tim's, low stocking rate. Yeah. How, and I suppose we're just interested in sort of debating everybody, do you mean if we we're sort of a non, if we're thinking more of a conventional way, the way to drive up profitability for a sheep system is to drive up stocking rate. And how does that fit with the sort of re, some of these region approaches between Rich has mentioned the need, the need for these longer rest periods. It doesn't always fit with these higher stocking rates that we seem to be promoting in other systems. Uh, if, if, if you're growing more, you, you, you can still be having a, higher if you're getting a, a higher total dry matter production you're still going to be able to push your stocking rate up aren't you because the feed budget is dependent on the total amount that you're growing not out not on how long your grass is when you go into it or how, how long your rest period is yeah it's so just to do with more can, paddocks i suppose more yeah. subdivision helps that question yeah yeah and rich do you have a target in terms of what your stocking rate do you want to do you measure in such things or what would you now be measuring your system is in sorry what's your targets um i was going to work this out and i and i because of the chat that was on the on the group um through the week but i haven't um so we're 50 cows or just over and finish everything and we um, would be 400 ewes and just a handful of ewe lambs and finish all the lambs now on a with a conventional thing, if you stuck that into a calculator, that would say massively understocked. But it's like we've got a nine inch hill fort, it's 35 acres, it doesn't grow a lot of grass, but I'm trying to improve that with grazing. We've got a lot of sort of estate type grass, you know, with oak trees growing and, you know, those sort of open, not open fields, I mean, the average field would only be eight acres, but, you know, set stock, fields that have been historically set stocked and overgrazed in that sort of setting. So like half the farm basically doesn't grow a lot of grass. So for what we've got, we're probably overstocked, but I'm not sure we can afford to drop our stock that much. So at the moment we're just, you know, buying a bit of forage and making do that way. But um, does that answer the question? Probably not. You're, I suppose you're at the moment you're in that sort of transition phase, but your ambition is to push stock numbers up, but not increase land area. Or are you happy where you are? I don't think that's the right measure because, and I read that there's a guy called Alex Heffron. He might be on the call. I don't know. He's he's on on Twitter, but he wrote a blog post about you know, like we read we read what the guys are doing in America, like sticking and their their stocking rates are flying because they're historically really low, whereas our stocking rates are his, historically quite high because of the inputs we use probably, and so actually maybe they've got to come down. I don't know, but. Uh, you know ask me in five years and maybe i'll have a better answer i don't know and i suppose it's well nick will also the example from nick which is it's not necessarily about number of sheep is it's about how those enterprises fit together so have you got the right ratio of cows to use what other enterprises could you put on that farm rather than necessarily increasing the sheep numbers per se yeah it's about profit at the end of the year isn't it that's that's the thing that really matters and um 
I want to push the cattle back and bring up and bring the sheep down, but just the way it's working at the moment with, with different things and, and, and whatever, we, that will be a transition we'll try and make over the next few years. Because are, are the cattle grazing the mixed swords now, or all of them, some of them, or just the fattening ones? Or They tend not to, but that's because I've only just started with the fences, and I figure that the cattle will do a better job of regenerating the overgrazed permanent pasture. But then I have got some, well, we should have a couple of animals going off grass. I mean, it's very difficult when you, it's, you, you know, you're not going to suddenly, well, I mean, you, if you set your farm up to it, you might be able to do it as a general rule. But because we supply a butcher every week of the year, most of the cattle come inside to get that bit of finish on. But I have, I have got some um, um, cattle on some mixed species swords, yes. Steers, fattened steers. And Nick, do you want to just talk us through in terms of what you're up to with your, because you've changed your, that ratio you used to sheep yeah. to rat cattle. Um, so when we, when we first came here, we uh, had dairy heifers inside um, and had started rotational grazing, started to grow lots more grass and got quite excited and slightly vain and for some reason we wanted a thousand sheep. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then um, one day Reno, <laughs> he was just charging around and he forgot his pin number and he, um, he um, diagnosed himself with a breakdown because he forgot <laughs> his pin number and said we need to have less sheep. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, now we've gone down it quite quickly over four years to, um, we've got 450 sheep this time and um, we've now got 50, 60 suckler cows and the difference is unbelievable. It, it's, um, we've obviously got less sheep, we are producing less lambs, but we're, we're, the, the survivability is much better, the scan is much better. Um, and just illness, they just, I think you, you need that balance and it's taken us um, quite a lot of years to, to understand oh, that. Yeah, but yeah. It is, it's getting back to that mixed farm that, yeah. that people did for years and then we tend to specialise, don't we? And it's all, I guess it goes back to the regenerative thing where in nature you don't get monocultures. And that's, so, so at the minute everything is pretty good we, we probably still need to have a few less sheep um but my, my worry is when people start to grow more grass and then they get more sheep or more of something and i think there's a sweet spot i think and, and I you, you've always got the, the problem of the relative profitability of the two species haven't you um, yeah I mean, when i reduced my suckler cows back in the late 90s i mean i was spending all summer gathering feed and straw for them and all winter feeding it and, and actually making no money out of them at all. Um, you know, when, when cattle were a very full, full return. And, and so you tend to have to be a little bit flexible with markets. They've been a bit more stable, I suppose, relative to one another of recent times. Um, but there is always that, that balance to work on. And w would you say you're now more profitable, Nick? Yeah. Than you yeah, definitely. I mean, I was I was just doing our accounts today, and our vets bill is now just not much. And when we had a lot of sheep, we were just having lots of worm trouble, lots of lameness, and you really do notice the difference of your just less input. Um, and and with the lambs are nearly all gone, and yeah, so yeah, it, it's and it's just less stressful. He's, he can remember his pin number. It's and, always and, good. You know, it, it's a balance between your capabilities, your desires, what you want out of life. That's the yeah. whole, because we, we, we gaily talk about regen ag. We're, we've only been talking about it in relation to actual production. We haven't been talking about it in, in its whole sense. The main aspect of which is uh, quality of life. Yeah. And, and, that needs bringing into it as well because that has a value particularly well, think, to people yeah. like you with a young family and things like that you know it definitely has a has a value doesn't it well i think rich we spoke about that didn't we the other day yeah either yep yep 
yeah, you, you, you just you don't want to be a kind of busy fool and then spend no time with the family. That's right. Um, Absolutely. I've got, you know, the, I haven't got it. I could probably do with a little bit more electric fencing, but we're somewhere near now. I can take my little boy out in the truck. He's only, you know, he's only 20 months or whatever. So we can, we can move cattle out, Hereford's, Hereford cattle, they're all pretty quiet. Um, we can move a bunch of sheep and then you could have your essential jobs done within, well, a couple of hours, you know, easy by lunchtime. I know obviously there's more stuff to do. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I only work two hours a day, but, but like if you, if I have to help, you know, I have to have look after my little boy and my wife's working or, or he's ill or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's set up that I can, I can do that. That's, that's, that is one of the goals. Definitely. Definitely. And, and like, it just, just makes so much more sense, you know, especially with it. All right. If you've got a high cost, high value, higher value product, like a, you know, there are other industries where you might make more silage and take it to a shed and all that sort of stuff. But all I'm trying to do is take costs out of the system. That is my that is my main goal all the time. And I haven't got there. I might never get there, but I'm trying to, that's where I'm trying to get. So how does that work? So you farm with your mum and dad? With dad, yeah. Well, yeah, mum, but with dad, yeah. And how how has he been on his journey? He is. Um, <laughs> oh, it's, 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 hesitation. Um, you know, he's he's very patient actually, and he can see. You know, so he says it's like going back to the old days, and it is a way. In a way, it is kind of that, like that. But as long as his cows are happy, and he's, he can, you know, he's got a few fields around the buildings that are set stopped, and he can carve the cows there, and he's happy. He doesn't really mind about the rest. You know, he won't move the fences. Um, but I can do that, and if I can't do it, I've got people that can help me as well. Or I can, or I can just like Rob, Rob, Rob Havard is. Um, I speak to Rob a bit. He's got a lot of good ideas, and and and, and you just have to be realistic. If you want to go away for the weekend, and nobody else is going to move your fence, somebody might look at your animals. Just leave them on a two-day move or a three-day move. It doesn't matter really. Once you've got enough to eat, and then you just go back to your daily move if that's what you're doing. Then on when you come home, it doesn't matter. You don't have to die on your sword for like, oh my goodness, they got to be moved every 12 hours. It's just, you just don't have to do that all the time. It's just not, if it doesn't have to be like that, it doesn't have to be like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it's this balance yeah. all the time, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I just have one or two um, quick questions. Uh, the first is for you, Nicola. You say he remembers his pin. What is it? So we can... <laughs> um, so he well, doesn't need money in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not spending it on vets, so it has to be going somewhere. Um, <laughs> and not on haircuts. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> moving on. Um, there was one or two questions, uh, I know, and, and you, you answered, answered on the chat, Rich, but what do you think is the balance between cattle and sheep in a regen system um, in terms of the ratios? And then following on from that, do you think you can have um, you know, a regenerative tall grazing system with just sheep? Um, so I, I had a chat with a, a quite a good farmer from Scotland back in the autumn and we, he was driving somewhere and we had a long chat for about an hour or something and we, he, he sort of suggested like a 60, 40 cattle bias, maybe, maybe more moving in that, in that direction. Do I think sheep can be truly regenerative? I think that, that answering that question is above my pay grade, but, um, one of the best podcast and I, 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 I think I have I don't think I have watched the video I'm not sure but listened to it on a podcast a couple of times is the meeting that, that um, Nick uh, and Liz did with um, with Jaime and um, the way he talks about it it is more cattle than sheep cheaper a part of the system because sheep the way they eat they just eat the best and if you can organize it that they don't that you don't let them graze the best all the time by you know rapid moves and all that sort of stuff that they will if they eat the best they'll graze it out do you see what i mean whereas cattle you can get them to eat the, the non not so good stuff down to reset it and then it comes to, to, i've really explained that badly but i think jaime did a much better job and i learned a lot on that course that that meeting so i think he was july no june the june one i think lost track i, th I think you've probably got to accept that the as, as we were talking about the other day when we had a pre-meeting discussion, that the sheep isn't just a small cow. Um, 
that they do have to be managed slightly differently for a sort of certainly three or four months of the year um, from lambing onwards and that you can't drive them into long uh, pastures at that sort of stage. You can do them when they're dry um, through the winter as well. They can, uh, and I think you've probably done this as well, Nick, you, you've um, stored pasture to graze over the winter. Um, they can certainly be used to do that. Um, but in the stage of their production cycle where they've got from lambing onwards, where they've got young lambs with them and probably almost almost up to weaning, you, I don't think you can go into these very long, in quotes, regenerative type grazing modes. Um, and interestingly enough, again, when I was with Tim, we had a, a group of dry you, dry shearlings, I suppose that had been the previous year's ewe lambs, running with cattle, and we called them a flurd, mixture between a flock and a herd. Um, and the sheep were quite happy running with sort of 300, 350 kilogram cattle and going into long swords, moving around with them. There'd have been 100 cattle and sort of, oh, I can't remember how many sheep, a couple of hundred probably all in together. And they, they work quite happily like that. And did those those sheep have lambs with them? Or is that no, just, no, they, they, just they were dry? No, no, they were dry sheep. Yeah. So just again, on that. From, from, from weaning onwards, you can, you can do the same thing with the, with the dry sheep, I'm sure you can run those in, in longer, uh, a third, a third, and a third, third, eat a third, stamp on a third, and whatever it is you do with the other third, I can't remember now, but I think that's how it works. Uh, leave it. Leave it, leave it behind, yeah. You, you can do that with dry sheep, but not with ewes and lambs. So I suppose there's one or two comments coming through in terms of more of a leader follower system. Do you, you know, let the sheep in first, have the cattle in after uh, to clean out? Um, if they think, you know, what do people think in terms of it is worth the effort? Would that work in those systems? Um, I know, Rich, I think it says are they, you've only done the cattle this year in terms of grazing, so they wouldn't necessarily be, you're given a straight break rather than having cattle come in cleaning out. But then, but then that, like, perhaps I'm wrong, but that's a conventional mindset trying to answer, do you know what I mean? That's almost two things. What are you trying to achieve? And uh, so I'd say Alex Brewster, like, look, his um, Nuffield app is, is brilliant, but um, the sheep are going to browse, the cattle, you could make them eat more, you know, like, like, like Jan's just said, right? That you just, you know, that's the kind of, that's, that's the way they graze. If you let the sheep have the best, and let's say you've got them on a daily move, and they're going down and they're browsing the best, and, you're, and you know, you're achieving your 300 grams a day, you know, that sort of thing, they, they're, they're happy because they're having the best and they're moving on. But then I, you could, I mean, maybe you could bring the cattle in behind, but there, you'd have to bring dry cows or something, and, you, and you'd have to, you'd have to work with that. But, but what Alex was suggesting is give it a break. You know, give it those thirty days or twenty-one days or whatever it is. Give it a break, let it regrow, then bring your cattle in, then eat it down. But that cattle, um, the dry matter requirement of the of the of the cat of the bunch of the cattle would have to be higher than the dry matter dry matter requirement of the sheep per day because you'd want the sheep to browse and have a little bit and then the cattle come in and they will have a higher requirement and they will eat it down not necessarily down to the ground but they will eat more in order that it regenerates again because you know the way the grass grows you've got to go and you've got to go below the growing point to stop it heading if that's what you're trying to do but then is it going to see such a bad idea i don't know it's technical beyond my beyond my um beyond my pay grade again but you see what I mean I don't I don't know if you necessarily have to be obsessed of having the one behind the other to get it down to a certain a certain place because that's not that's not necessary you don't need to do that I mean what well, I mean you do want to do that but I don't see why you would want to I think it's also like every grazing system we're trying to make it fit into a very disciplined we're going to do this for the next three months and actually we all know that plans evolve don't they so you've still got to come up with what so I agree with Jan, which is for that point up until lamb weaning, with the key element is to get as much live weight gain on those lambs as yeah. physically possible. And so our system of, needs to adapt for that. And we can, in terms of the number of systems that are available to achieve that, but most peoples will be trying to get maximum live weight gain on those lambs for the most cost-effective approach. 
and I think and suckler cows with their calves we just have a lot more flexibility in terms of what they can utilize and still put on good growth rates on those calves yeah. so I still it still comes back to what your objective is and and yes unfortunately there is a trade-off isn't it at that time up until the lamb weaning is that it might not be doing the best thing for soil but then we can switch into other approaches once we have that opportunity i think um, what, i suppose what's Sorry. interesting that is what we've learned over the last few weeks is there's no one style of regenerative ag obviously there's broad principles but everyone adapts it to um, yeah. to their business and their farm but Liz, there is a question for you. Oh, I saw it wrongly. Um, now, <laughs> it, said, yeah. it said if you farmed, they obviously don't realise you do a bit of farming on the back, on the side. Um, <laughs> but what system would you follow in terms of regen, mixed sheep, cattle? So, yeah, my background is I come from a mixed beef, sheep and arable farm in South Lincolnshire. Um, so we are currently doing some rotational grazing lays through the arable, but we are not regenerative in our approaches. Um, so compared to the farms around us we would put quite a lot of fym back into those arable systems so our organic matters are still lower than you we would like but not as low as the farms around us um so yeah I, we do mix cat and sheep grazing with some with some rotation um and to be pedantic though the question is what would you do well your, i do sometimes you... normally when i'm on a tractor without a radio i sometimes have a mini breakdown and decide to so we should transform the entire farm to a regenerative approach but my father and i may have some few challenges about that well, we maybe invite him along for the, in, in the future and we'll, um, <laughs> he will definitely have an opinion and it's probably going to be different to mine on purpose just tell him you don't want to do it then um, that's true so just uh, just one or two quick ones um and kind of, uh, well, I'll go for actually the important one. How important do you see genetics in your systems? The genetics of the animals or the selection even maybe of, of the animals within, that, within these systems? I think, I think it's massive. Um, we're going to, I say, I'm buying, I've been buying replacements ever since I came home from college. Um, but um, I think, uh, I think they call it epigenetics again, this is, Stuff above my pay grade I've read about it but um if the if you everybody's got a slightly different system and so if you've got an animal that's bred on your own farm with the system the, the rainfall the grass da, 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 whatever then that animal will probably cope there better than one brought in and so um I think it I, I, I think it's I think it's massive um, but that's not to say you have to do that that's my choice but we lose our biggest problem is lambs that don't make it to two days old and i do ever i've done everything i can i try my absolute best and i but i think it's just mothering ability and it might even be 20 percent of the use that not saying they lose all the no, somebody losing 20 20 percent of the lambs but if 20 percent of the use aren't very good at mothering or they haven't quite got it right because they're not as good at mothering as the other 80 percent well that's 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 you know that's a problem isn't it so um we, we're going to start selecting on um, mothering ability um, so, because that's where our biggest problem is. Do you add to that, Jan? Um, it's difficult because I, I, I mean, to a certain extent, I'm completely reversed in that when I first started lambing outside in May, as a consequence of the bank manager knocking on the door and saying, if you don't do this a bit better, um, I'm going to pull the rug from under your feet. Um, I was in people said to me, Oh, well, you what you need is easy care sheep. Um, and to me, easy cares are an attitude of mind, uh, rather than a breed of sheep. Uh, I mean, I stuck with the breed I had, which was a mule, um, and it's, it's, as I say, you, you have to do everything that needs doing to them, you have to do that right, and if you do that right then I'm not sure that the breed matters too much. Um, that may be uh, heresy, but uh, I'm afraid that's how I feel. I think there's, there's an element of selecting, or you, of the challenge with mules, isn't it, in terms of your, you are buying in, but you're still culling out or making decisions on which ones retain in that flock every year. 
that's I suppose the debate of having a closed flock is you're in more control or of of those types of traits you have of of what you're in controlling in terms of traits I can't speak sorry um so the question in terms of what would you be doing for mothering ability so Rich what are you selecting for for mothering ability or aiming to just to say I don't disagree with what Jan said but I think we said the different things because they say there's more variety within a breed than there is across the breeds. Yep. So if you've got a yep. ewe that looks after it, it doesn't matter if she's a mule or an easy care or a Romney or whatever, if she bunts her lamb and buggers off to the side of the field or takes one with her and leaves the other one that she's just had that doesn't bother with that one, then it doesn't matter what breed it is. Do you know what I mean? It, so it's, it, 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 I, I, I need that, that was what I was saying. That was what I was uh, trying to say. I suppose what, I'm, what I was trying to say is if you're selecting her, selecting from her for the next generation, so you're retaining it, you have a greater power to influence that next generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because if you're buying in, your influence is you can decide on which farm you're buying in from or you can decide based on which sheep stays in that flock. You don't necessarily have control over the next generation coming in as much as you would do on a closed. Yeah. And, so, um, and, I mean, I've thought about this a lot, actually. Um, there was a couple of really good articles in the Farmers Weekly about a farm that did it, and they increased their... I can't remember. I've got it saved somewhere. It's on my desk. I'm over. I think it's underneath some papers. Um, but, um, but, yeah, any lamb that's assisted at birth, I would say you notch it, tag it, mark it, whatever. And you don't breed any ewe lamb from your A flock, which would be your best sheep. And you know we can talk more about that, but you know more about that than me. Um, if a ewe lamb is born that you would have to assist, then you make a decision. Then did you did you assist it because you were, felt you should, or did you? Uh, and anyway, you probably decide that you're not going to keep that, and therefore the lambs that you don't touch, you um, you know, you you would breed from that. Um have uh, just another question that's come in um and i think apologies because i think it was submitted earlier um so i forgot to get to it i'll try and paraphrase it uh, a bit so um so, so there's, uh, we have a farmer who's uh, farming uh, grazing sheep trying to follow the you know the pattern of eat a third trample a third and, and leave a third behind um first of all i should get credit for saying that three times um which is working well but uh, i suppose the challenge is you know, uh, they've been, she's been told by her neighbours that, you know, will create a, a layer of a patch on the bottom of the sward that maybe the sheep aren't trampling it down enough. Um, and this may prevent you grass coming through. Um, I suppose from your experience of grazing and grazing higher swards, do you find any build up a patch on the bottom or actually do you find the pastures still, you know, still coming through, still, still um, new? Rich? Honest answer, I don't really know. I tried to do that in the spring, but I got it horrendously wrong and it caused a few issues actually. Um, I did a plan and worked out we were going to run out of grass by like the 1st of July or something stupid because I just, you've got to get stock density, haven't you? You need, if you're going to do that properly, you need serious density, I think. And I know we've had a chat on, that. there's been a lot of threads on the chat about it and on the WhatsApp chat about it. And I, I say, I don't fully understand it. There are people doing it better than me. But um, I think in order for that really to, to work, you, you, I don't think you could, I'm not sure you can actually flip the switch, but maybe you can and start the one day you don't do it and the next day you do do it. I don't know. But um, I, I haven't, we haven't done that because I just couldn't get density in order to get it to work. So I, I, I don't really know. Um, and that's the debate. Like you've got the, they say the, the Jaime Alonso eat 80% and then the, Whatever it is, you know. Yeah. Isn't it Ian Mitchell in this? Where they tramp with the trampoline and how much do you leave behind? I can't remember, but yeah, it's an eternal debate, and I, I'm not sure I can be a. Be and a, then, yeah, in that. terms of that thatch question, the easiest way to is to then just, do you mean pull the grass apart and see what's going on? The ambition is that that dead material is being, if it's pushed in contact with the soil or near enough, then it will be pulled in by the soil biology that you're trying to improve. So as the soil biology gets hungrier, it will pull that thatch in. So I think the challenge will be when it's in that initial phase is it won't, it won't be hungry enough yet to pull it in. That, that, that certainly is a, is a problem in the, the parable context where you go into a, a really dead soil, getting that to kick start 
uh, getting the, the marker of mm. uh, form or whatever it is to start munching and pulling that stuff in. And, and that does build up over time and that then your breakdown is a lot more rapid, I think, as time goes on. But it, there are times, I think, initially when it looks horrendous. Um, we've had a question about bale grazing come in. I was just going to ask you both, um, winter, deferred grazing, or what, what are your plans for the winter time? Um, um, I'm, I'm, we've got, well, we will, we should have the cover, the, we planted half the cover crops and we've got some more cover crops to go in. It'll be a combination of, um, yeah, hay and cover crops and lamb, what, 10th of April around there. And you'll feed the hay, how, how do you do that? Is, is it, are they outside having hay? Or yeah, they... yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we've always used ring feed as a sheep in the past, which I know is not, not necessarily a good thing. I'm sure that's on your blog, Liz. I'm sure I read a blog post that you don't oh, no, I Ring feeders, ring, yeah. Ring feeders, but... Um, I'd like to move away from them, but I'm just, um, I, we better get some cattle this, this year, which is exciting in the, in the, in the wet weather. But um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure about the sheep just yet. I, I'm not sure. Because as you described your farm earlier, you've got, so most of it basically runs into a stream, doesn't it? So you've got to be quite careful in terms of how you graze. Oh, we, we're kind of flat bottom. Oh, right. There's nowhere, there's the risk, the risk. The risk is um, the risk factor would be yeah minor yeah okay. You you haven't in in terms of just thinking about the bale grazing in the context of the fact that you mentioned Rob Havard, have, have you any aspirations to do what he would do with uh, transferring old seed into your or other seed by bale grazing into your permanent pastures? Definitely, definitely. That is that is. Do you want to explain yeah. that? Because people may not understand that. Um, how that works. I did it. Okay, so I did it, but with cattle in the winter, we I split a field into five hectares into four strips, and um, put twenty five bales out in the field. Hay I did, and yeah, it was a bit of losses, but I think the losses we'd have got from. Um, Pecking in, in silage bales, I don't think it would have been a lot different actually, and obviously more cost because silage is more expensive to make. But 25 bales in each row, so there's 100 bales, a bale per day, and 100, and, 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 uh, 100 bales, 100 days grazing. And it, it, it sort of worked, and it, well, the field was pretty rough, but it actually came back. I, I, did, I did just run the power hour over it just to, just to level it out a bit if I'm honest, in the spring, because we had a bit of a family crisis and decided what we were going to do with it, which is not great. But anyway, that's what we did. But, the, but where their hoof print took the organic matter down into the soil, it retained moisture and it, it grew. It grew all summer, even though it was, you know, we had that dry time in May and, it, in, in, you know, sort of the dry time. So it's, um, it's a work in progress, but probably Rob would say the field wasn't ready for it because we haven't got the right species yet to start. But it's like what you go back to the soil biology, like you said before. If you watch Jake Freestone, I'm pretty sure it's his Nuffield or an interview he did with somebody, I can't remember. But when I think when he was in Uruguay or Brazil or somewhere like that, they put a leaf under a stone or pinned it down with a stone on the soil. And they went back, I think it was the next day, and that leaf was gone. And it wasn't because somebody had walked along and stolen it. It's because worms had come up and eaten it. You just cannot do that in this country. Well, I mean, maybe you can in some places, but you can't do it here on this farm because we haven't, our soil's not, you know, and this is probably on a farm that has been no-till for X many years. So, like you said, it's, it's, that, it's that intervening time, isn't it, until the soil biology gets going yeah. to the point where you can, the fats just gets eaten away. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just clearing up some questions that I've written down. Um, you called yourself an aged... Skeptic. An aged skeptic. Aged yeah. skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, um, so, so if you go back to, I don't know, um, 1982 or somewhere like that, yeah. how, have you, how have you changed in your head? Might not have done at all. Um, how have you changed your thinking um, from, like, from then till today? 
1982, oh, that's interesting, really. Um, in 1982, I'd, I'd bought sheep, but I didn't know very much about them, so I, I, I learned on the job, really. Um, I mean, my previous experience with sheep had been when I was about seven or eight on my cousin's farm. Um, but yeah, learned a heck of a lot about sheep nutrition, really, um, in that intervening period. Uh, of more recent times, having gone from, well, at one stage having done a fair bit of work when I was in the Research Institute with ICI, and consequently, obviously, was a blue bag man for quite a long time after that. Um, now, moved a bit away from that through the uh, thinking about soil, which I hadn't really thought about before. And I, I came, a, it came to me, oh crikey, two or three days ago, um, the farm that I first rented some ground off, the arable manager there one day said to me, you know, all the soils there for us to hold the plant up, all the rest of it, I can either feed it out of a bag or do it out of a can, which this was in about 1984, I guess, which a bit describes how uh, intensive arable farmers at one stage were considering the soil. Well, now I've somewhat altered since then, <laughs> <laughs> particularly in, in the last 10 years and continue to do so more and more as time goes on. Um, these had a, I, I sent her some pictures, and one of those pictures is of a herd of suckler cows um, that I was looking after for a guy in the next village till just before lockdown. Um, and I, I looked after them for two years and tried to persuade him and, and on, on his farm to move in the regenerative direction. Uh, whether he will or not, I don't know, because it was contract farm. But... Mentally, certainly, I've, I've moved quite dramatically, mostly in the last 10 years, I guess, um, to realising how important, really, and realising that soil is important. I don't think I'd really thought about it too much before then. Um, I might, it may be because I was what you said you were at one, possibly at one stage, a busy fool, mm. um, with, with probably with too many sheep. <laughs> um, but... Yeah. Uh, so I suppose yeah. that's where the kind of mentoring, so you, you, you help mentor people now. Yeah, yeah. As, as much as anything, but the, the, the main ones are people who've worked for me in the past, who've now got flocks of their own. Um, but yeah, it, again, shifting them onto those sort of thoughts aren't that easy either. Surprisingly enough, I mean, several of them are in their sort of 30s, 40s, 50s now. Um, and getting that mindset across isn't always that easy. Um, mm. It, it I, really I, isn't. Because yeah. I think, Richard, you, you, you're part of a couple of WhatsApp groups, aren't you? And, yes. And they're, they're very active, very active, and yes. so good. Yes, definitely. There's so much, there's so much great knowledge out there. Um, sorry, I'm just replying to somebody who's asked for uh, <laughs> a book a recommendation. Um, but um, yeah, there's so much good knowledge out there. But like, we never lived at a point in time in history, human history, where so much information is available. And I think Gabe Brown said, "Don't, don't." If you, if you want to do the whole farm, do the whole farm. Don't get me wrong. Pick a five-acre field. Pick a six-acre field and just try it. You know, like, like, like Charlie, Charlie Morgan said at that first meeting I went to, stick a fence up, put your sheet there, and by the time you get to the end of the summer or the end of the month, you'll want to go and buy some more fencing to not only split it one way, you'll want to split it four ways. And then, and then, do you know what I mean? It's just, you know, there's something the brain gets going and... Um, and, 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 you know, and, and, and dairy farmers have been doing it for years, but I think a lot of the reason for that is that they've got that instant feedback. You can see how much milk's in the tank, you can see what they're doing. Whereas, you know, sheep farmers, we've only really just started weighing and working out daily low rate gains, really, because now the electronic stuff's there, it's easy, isn't it? Um, who would have sat down with a calculator and worked it out across a bunch of sheep if you had to write it all down? I don't expect yeah. many people to do that. 
But it's, I mean, back to Jan's point, which is when it used to be everything was possible with fertiliser and a can of chemicals. The reason why change is happening in arable systems, some of them, is because they don't, the choices have gone. So exactly. it is that, and for some, I suppose, livestock is that it is sometimes to do with a slight midlife crisis. It's sometimes to do with that they need to do you mean it's about their overdraft is just too big do you mean it yeah. do you mean the motivation doesn't always come from i like bees and butterflies it comes from a <laughs> position of oh shit what are we going to do next <laughs> exactly what i said about my motivation at the yeah. turn of the millennium was the bank manager sitting at the kitchen table and saying we want to convert your overdraft into a loan if you don't do something about it you can always go and drive a white van can't you I bloody nearly socked him once, you know. <laughs> he was lucky to escape from the house with his life. And I've never trusted a man in the pinstripe suit and grey shoes since. But it did, it did make me reappraise the whole system. You know, and I think, and, it was, and agreed with Rich, not only have we got, an inf we've got information, but we've also got subsidies reducing in the next five years, yeah. probably. And do you mean, so there is, in terms of driving decisions or different decisions, it's a really interesting time as well. Definitely. I've always been, like, we were brought up on um, homeopathy and natural medicine. I know that might sound really weird and that's fine. You can say what you like, but, um, like, that's, you know, they, that I don't, Dad never liked spraying and we never, but it was just like what you did, you know what I mean? So it's always been there in the back of my mind. I never enjoyed doing it. I never enjoyed putting nitrogen on, not really. But you did it because that's what you did. And then suddenly somebody says, well, actually, red clover will fix, what, 200 kilos of nitrogen a year if you get it right? And you're like, hang on a minute. That's more than I can legally put on. All right, it's not all available, all those different things. But, you know, it, 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 it's not a big jump to get to the point where you think, right, this, well, this system will actually work on its own. Because guess what? Nature's been doing it for millions of years. And we think we're really clever because we've, you know, messing about with chemicals for, what, 100 years? It's nuts when you think about it. So, so I suppose um, conscious of time as well, but I'm just interested from Rich's perspective. If you had your time again, not that you've had your time, it's fine. It's only five <laughs> years. If you know now, if you knew now, then no, you know what I mean. If you knew then, we well, you know now. How would you start? So what, when, what age am I starting? <laughs> <laughs> so five years ago, when you started the journey, but you've got all of the knowledge you've got in your brain now. What would you have done differently five years ago? I'll edit that bit out. I might have just bought more fencing. Yeah. But um, and it's funny how these things work, right? So we had a grant from the local rivers authority, rivers charity, to fence the brook off as part of a European scheme to keep stock out water courses. And as part of that, and we had to pay like half the money as well. We piped water to the fields that were that the, 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 the brook fed. But um, I paid a bit more and took the pipes to fields we never had water in because the field, well, my red clover field then, it had been ploughed for like 20 years and it was, you had to power her out like three times. And I knew that I sort of was starting to understand more and I knew that was wrong because you shouldn't have to do that. Why wouldn't you plough a grass field up? Is it great? And this one's not. And so, yeah, so... I'd have just done those things a bit faster, more fencing and then the water and we put the proper pump system in two years ago and it's just like bang, revolution, you know. Um, yeah, that's what I would have done, done it faster. But I probably had to be in the place to know that that's what I wanted to do yeah, yeah. because you can't, it is evolution, not revolution in some ways because you can't, do you know what I mean? If something doesn't quite work out properly, you think, oh, you know, it's not working this year. I'm going to, I'm going to go, you know, go back to what I did before because I know that works. So, and then yeah. I suppose a question to Jan, which is, if if you were given the opportunity to farm again, or you can still farm or do whatever you want. Anyway, if you had your time again, what would you do differently? Oh crikey, that's um, a horrible question, but it it, it certainly is. Uh, well, start starting where we sit now, definitely. Um, multi-species swords um, hopefully in a, an area that has more rainfall I've spent my life in, a, in low rainfall fighting shortages of water in pastures 
And when I was, when you're trying to do grassland research and you can't grow any damp grass because it's too dry, <laughs> bearing in mind that 75 and 76 were two of the uh, major years when I was trying to do work on dairy cow grazing management strategies, it was a little difficult. Um, but yeah, I, I think definitely look at mixed mixed walls without a shadow of a doubt. And and when you say spend spend the money on on that and electric fencing, but you don't need to do it the whole farm at once. As Rich said, you and as what Charlie said to him, you know, you do a, a piece at a time and, and convince yourself that it works. And the next, you know, you want to be down buying more fencing next week, don't you? Because it's it's already working. And do it do it to start with with um, temporary electric fencing because you might not don't put up too much permit because you probably put it in the wrong place. Thank you. Um, I have one one last question, um, and, and uh, well, I also think we might need a book club. It seems book recommendations are flying. Um, <laughs> but and I think it's a it's a good question. Um, is region ag more profitable? Or I suppose sometimes with livestock, are you just losing a bit less? <laughs> oh, Joseph, that's that's a probably question. Sorry, well, is, it, I think we've you know I think and and not just today's talk, but everyone's mentioned kind of, I suppose the the positives of of this type of farming, and you feel like you're working with the land, maybe not against it as much, but at the end of the day, there's there's bills to be to be paid. So, do you feel like this system makes you more resilient? Um, yeah. Makes you able. Yeah. So that without without a shadow of a doubt, um, in terms of sustainable and resilient, whatever you like, whatever the buzzword is at the moment, really, um, I don't know how rich feels, but I, I would definitely say that. And and again, in in the dry south, and, and riches would be dry as well. Um, that those sort of mixed wards, particularly if you got red clover, you know, that they, it's unbelievable. Um, and we had a very dry summer. Oh, I don't know. 10 or 15 years ago and I had a neighbour then who had uh, an organic dairy herd and they'd sown some red clover swords next to where I got a lot of lambs to weed, it was about a 50 acre field and that was the only green field in the whole of Oxfordshire at the time, everywhere else was brown. Um, you know, so those sort of things do build resilience into your, into your operation, they really do. And that and and the the um, rotational grazing, you know, it, it extends the period of time before you get before you're in disaster straits with, with drought and so on. Rich, do you feel it the same from your system in terms of how you're fit? I was going to use fit for the future. There's two apps. I got a buzzword in. Um, but in terms of you know, Liz mentions the changes. Do you think you're better prepared now? for whatever policy changes are in the UK with the practices you're undertaking? Definitely, definitely. But I think almost you can't, it's not quite, it might not be quite 100% true to say it, but if you do what you do well or very well, then it'll probably stand up. But I think with all the changes that are happening and, and, and everything that I think um, a less risky system, you know, to, to, and, 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 um, say the climate is changing, I don't want to get into that debate, but in 18 it was dry and we weren't completely green, but we were greener than the neighbours. And back in May when we had eight, eight mil of rain and April wasn't particularly damp and then we had quite a lot in June, but it went quite cold. Like we, um, and, and now we've just had a dry spell as well. We're greener than the neighbours. I see they've got some, um, you know, some feeders out for their cattle and feeding out bales and stuff like that their fields barren and they've got you know whatever they it's brown uh, you know so so you, yeah you build a more resilient system and um at some point some that th there will be more costs won't there because that we, we keep being told we're going to be paid we're going to have to put a value on the environment so when that happens um then it will it will have to change i think and i don't enjoy like you know buying feed and then taking a bag out on the cob like and filling up the creek feeder been there and done that and lost ewes heads in creek feeders and lambs have blown up and stuff like that it's just i just you know just not not keen on it to be honest and if that's what you want to do and it works for you that's absolutely fine i've got no problem with that at all but not for and, and sheep are ruminants they're meant to eat forage 
Exactly. My, my opinion is if you want to feed cake to animals, keep pigs. You know, other, otherwise, you know, forage feed them. But I would, the, the one thing to say is you can do a lot of this just with rotational grazing. It doesn't necessarily need to have the term regen ag hung on it. It, it isn't a, a panacea. If you're not doing a good job to start with, with your livestock tasks and you're not um, doing worm counts and, and checking your body condition score or your use and, and all your uh, livestock tasks, if you're not on top of those, it is, it's not a silver bullet. No point in pretending that it is. Thank you. We haven't killed enough lambs this time and um, I've done nothing different from what I did last year. We were bolusing and mineral drenching lambs and um, that was that was pretty good. We moved to an injectable cobalt B12 and um, they flew in June and they stood still in July and they're supposed to last till September. Now I'm not saying the injectable didn't work but like you say there's no just because they're grazing that grass that you put on the picture there Liz it doesn't mean like Jan said it's not a silver bullet we've still got the same issues we're using less wormers than we ever have we're using less medicines than we ever had like, like Nick said virtually non-existent antibiotics really and I went, I went to a meeting and a vet was was there and he said actually an anti-inflammatory painkiller is 90% of the time or maybe 80% of the time is actually more beneficial anyway so um, but we've still got a trace element problem because we're low in cobalt and low in selenium so that's our biggest thing is working out how to how to how to tackle that I think um, and then we're, we're just going to go back to the bonuses and, and the drenching um, I'm finished with the questions. Apologies for the ones I didn't manage to get to. I'm just uh, conscious on time. So thank you. Thank you, Joseph. So, Nick, we've got to decide our take home messages. I know. Um, <laughs> well, mine is um, that it's not uh, full grass grazing with sheep isn't straightforward. Um, rotational grazing might be as it gets and I don't think you should be religious about length um, and so so yeah I suppose it's don't be rigid be very flexible as Jan said there's no silver bullets but what I do think is and we've had a, a lot of listeners tonight, and a lot of people asking questions breaking up again uh, Nicola I think this is a subject that we you learn from other people. Am I? Yeah. Oh, no. Is that better? The key yeah. point is that you learn you from me? other people. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So it's good to talk. That's that's my take home. And so yeah, it's good. To talk. Ironic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think mine would be, I think it's similar, which is actually, and why I love grazing systems is because there's so many different yeah. ways of doing it. And I think what's interesting that previously we were really focusing on rotational grazing was in a way of increasing grass utilisation and reducing cost. Um, and I suppose the message has moved on to actually focusing on soil health. And I think it's just becoming a more richer and more interesting sort of conversation to have so actually how can we but fundamentally it comes back to improving animal performance reducing costs and also improving that soil and, and grassland utilization so it is we can do all sorts of things in loads of different ways but we will yeah. we share um, that sort of similar goal really and i think it is sheep to answer the question we set which is can sheep be regenerative Yes, but it's just not quite as simple as the approach with cattle, I would suggest. Yeah. Just they're not yeah. just small cows. Yeah, and, and that leads, can you hear me? Am I clear? Yeah. That leads us at some point we're going to do one of these one month about dairy farming. Um, can dairy farming be truly regenerative? And I think that that is a similar dilemma to sheep. Um, but next time, Liz. Yep. Um, we're going to do some tokenism for ease of me to say, which is basically we're just going to invite. Uh, so the 
what's come out of this sort of conversations we've been having, having since sort of um, April time is that most of the people that we've spoken to have been males. Um, there's nothing wrong with males at all. We love boys. We do. Um, and but um, but what we're interested in is also getting a bit of more of a female voice um, rather than just us two and um, and Kerry, sorry, with the dung beetles. Um, so yeah, so we're we're inviting some females who are working within the regenerative world because I'm we're, I'm just really intrigued by about forty percent of the people who work in agriculture are women. So why are we talking mainly to men? So that's the next one. And why is it women talking to the men? We, you should have male compare, perhaps. Liz. We've got Joseph. Excellent point, yeah. actually. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my leprechaun does not like to be classed as any. Oh, isn't that asexual oh. leprechaun? Yeah, I'm staying. I'm, I'm, staying out, I'm staying out of this one. Uh, so we're going to cause all sorts <laughs> move of on, isms. Move on. Isms. Yeah. That's what we're going to call it next time. Um, but yeah, just interesting to get some different voices. And yeah, anyway, we'll try it and see what happens. That's and thank you all very much for um, can I, joining us. Can tonight. I just say before I yes. go, it's really important because you talk about three of the top people in the world, never mind gender Dr. Elaine Ingham, Dr. Christine Jones, and Nicole Masters, and Sarah Flack from America with her book about the art of science of grazing. So there's four people who are like, you know, never mind the men, they are, you know, running, running the show. So that, it, it definitely, it, we need more female voices. Thank you, um, Rich. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was well, very passionate, Richard, yes. Um, but, um, <laughs> thank you, Jan and Richard, so much. And Richard, you live in England, in Hereford. <laughs> Why I said that, I don't know. I think it's because you sound a bit Welsh. But you're not Welsh. You're... <laughs> Stop <laughs> talking! Very clear. Yeah. You're, you're not filling that hole, Nicola. No, uh, okay. I'm going to meet my <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.